Well, it is my delight to introduce a dear friend of mine, Claire DeGraff. And apparently we've known each other for over 40 years. Is that possible? Yeah, we have, actually. Is that yeah. possible? Well, anyhow, welcome to the podcast, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for having me, Randy. Uh, let me say a little bit more about Claire. Uh, he's, I think you're going to see he's a pretty amazing dude. He's a native of Grand Rapids, Michigan, where he still makes his home. He's been married to his high school sweetheart, Susan, for over 50 years, and they are parents to six children, grandparents to 20 amazing grandkids. He graduated from Calvin College, and early in his career, one of his top priorities was for him to have a successful business and make a lot of money. Again, that's something that probably a lot of people have, and he did it. He did an incredible job. But then a life-threatening encounter with cancer at that point got his rapt attention and ultimately led him to discover what he really wanted and needed was a life-saving relationship with Jesus Christ. In his own words, this is how he put it. He said, I fell in love with Jesus and I fell out of love with my, quote, mistress, my business. And even a few years later, then he felt the call of God to sell that business and devote full time to serving the kingdom of God, which he's been doing. And since making that decision, he's been involved in a number of ministries touching from well, I can tell millions of lives around the world. And at his core, he has a heart for evangelizing and discipling men, leading them to following Jesus as Claire does wholeheartedly. He's the author of a bestseller, The Ten Second Rule. And we got a lot more to say, but again, Claire, thanks for taking a few minutes to talk with me. I'm honored to be with you, so fire away. All right, my friend and brother in Christ. Now, you were right, like I was, you were raised in a, a Christian home, a good Christian home, but you didn't really have a, a personal relationship with Christ until yeah. until later, it sounds like. Tell us a little about that story, would you? Yeah, I did grow up in a great Christian home. My my church was a Bible-believing church. Uh, I went to Christian schools all my life, mm -hmm. um, and my parents lived the gospel. In fact, I tell people, the only gripe I have with my parents, they can't blame my dysfunctions on them. I mean, they were really nice, <laughs> they were nice people, but <clears throat> they really didn't have a relationship with Jesus Christ either. I mean, uh, Christianity was something to be believed and then to kind of lived out and um, and to serve and to be generous and to be kind. Mm -hmm. But we didn't we didn't talk in terms of having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It was just being a good Christian. And and so we were kind of taught to do that. So I, I substituted. I mean, I believed every word of the Bible to be true. I believe Jesus Christ to be the son of God. I, I there's nothing about the Bible I didn't agree with. Um, but I believed in God, but I just didn't live for God. And I and I didn't understand the disconnect until too late in life or I didn't want to understand it because it may have handicapped um, uh, my desire to make a ton of money as fast as fast as I could. So I chose to ignore the, you know, the teachings of Jesus in, in a way that I should not have, but I won't blame my church or my parents. They yeah, I hear you. Well, you know, they say the difference between heaven and hell is 18 inches yeah. between here and your heart. Wow. And it sounds like it was a lot up in your head, but not a lot in your heart and, and in your life at the time, right? It was, no, not much. Nope. I was just going for it. Okay, so then what happened? How did that change? Well, um, uh, yeah, I was just a, a, a businessman. I took over our small family company when my dad um, mm -hmm. got cancer. Mm -hmm. And um, and we made parts for office furniture. Um, the, primarily the screws that made office furniture go up and down underneath the, oh, sure. underneath the chair. You could turn a nut and a bolt and made the chair go up and down. Yep, yep. And, um, and, but when I was my last year at Calvin, I got a patent on a tilt mechanism, the whole mechanism that makes the chair tilt. Okay. And, and my dad courageously tooled for it. Um, and eventually became the largest selling chair mechanism in North America. Wow. My dad died before he ever saw that success. I mean, mm -hmm. we were just starting to take off. He died at 46. Mm -hmm. I ran the business then till age 30. One, um, I we had 175 employees mm -hmm. running two shifts a day, um, 100,000 square foot plant. I was building strip malls. I mean, my every dream that I had when I was a kid about being wealthy and a person of influence, um, I had. And I had a 
great family, a wife and three kids. Mm -hmm. And um, I loved them, I loved her. And uh, yeah, then one day a doctor walked to my hospital room and said, Clara, you have non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and I don't think you'll see your 40th birthday. And how old were you at the time? A few days before th age 31. Okay, wow. Wow, then what happened? Well, obviously it came as a shock to me and I remember him leaving my hospital room and I thought, what are they gonna put in my epitaph? He made 13.2% on sales. And obviously the next month or so is a whirlwind starting on chemotherapy and I had to tell my employees, you know, that I had cancer. And so you have to make some adjustments, a lot of adjustments in how you think and plan and so forth. But <clears throat> over, that, over that month, the month and a half, I began to notice people in my church. I always noticed them before, but they were turned on to Jesus in a way that I was not. Mm. They were always they're always praising the Lord and hugging people and carrying these big what I would call NIV uh, New Industrial Bibles. And, New Industrial uh, <laughs> Bible. Okay. <laughs> they were they were huge zippered things, and you know you could tell they read them. And you know I just didn't know many people like that, and I just kind of thought they were Jesus freaks. And I was in Boy Scouts when I was a kid, and 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 I was an Eagle Scout, and I just thought they were, the, you know, the Eagle Scouts of Christianity, and good for them. I just didn't see the point myself. I mean, I mm -hmm. Jesus. I was a covenant kid and born and baptized in the church. Mm -hmm. What could be wrong with me? And yet, it began slowly dawning on me that that they might have something I don't have. Mm -hmm. I'm not exactly sure I wanted it because I don't want to be a Jesus freak. But this was too important to miss. So I went to a pastor friend of mine, and I said, what do these people have that I don't have? He said, well, they have a relationship with Jesus Christ. He said, well, you know, I've heard that term someplace before, but how does that happen? I mean, I know Jesus is alive someplace in heaven on galaxy far, far away, but I mean, how do you actually have a relationship with Jesus? And he said, well, how did you have a relationship with your wife? I said, well, she looked good in school one day, and we started dating and we talked and talked and talked and I fell in love with her. So he said, well, how much time did you spend talking to God every day? Kind of stopped me short and I'm thinking, should I lie to a pastor? <laughs> well, I better not, this is, <laughs> this is too important. So I said, well, I pray before I eat uh, at least three times a day. Yeah. And if Susan and I are having a problem or a problem at work and I'll pray, um, and I go to church twice on Sunday, and uh, he said, well, if you actually had talked to your wife, Susan, your, um, your girlfriend, maybe 30 seconds, three times a day, and then went her to lecture about her twice on Sunday, do you think you'd actually fall in love with her? And I wow. almost laughed out loud. Of course not. So he said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to read the book of Luke, a chapter a day, mm -hmm. for the next 28 days or 30 days a month. There's 28 day chapters in Luke. Yeah. And he said... But before you do that, I want you to pray this prayer. God, teach me everything you want me to know and give me the guts to live it. Wow. And then come back in a month and tell me what you've learned. It didn't take a month. Um, within a couple of weeks, I understood the disconnect completely. Mm. The kind of person Jesus described bore no relationship to me because while I believed in him, I had no intention of seriously obeying him unless it wasn't terribly inconvenient. Mm. You know, I could, write, I could write donation checks, I could serve on boards, I could teach Sunday school. But in terms of, of actually living like Jesus and being proud as a follower of Jesus, I was an undercover Christian. Yeah. And in business, people knew I was a Christian because I was kind of high profile in the community, but not because of my character. Mm. And so I knew that there was something seriously wrong but I wasn't ready to give up yet. I, I was the proverbial rich young ruler just sniffing around the trap, yeah. just knowing that if I put my paw in that trap, it was going to snap shut and it was going to hurt. And God was going to change me in ways that I'm not sure I wanted to. I had a beautiful cottage in Lake Michigan. I had a Mercedes convertible in the garage. Uh, we were living large and I just knew God was going to mess me up. And to my shame, I thought I was going to regret following Jesus. So I spent six months essentially trying to find plan B, a less costly, less intrusive way of following Jesus than actually obeying Jesus. And of course, there isn't any. 
And uh, so at that point, I asked God to please forgive me. And I started all over again. I assumed I was not a believer. I had to confess my sin. Mm -hmm. I had to ask God to forgive me. Um, and I really didn't even know how to do it. I had to go to a local bookstore and buy a four spiritual laws from Campus Crusade to learn how to get myself saved because I, I was that ignorant. <laughs> you know, you're not the only person that's done that. I'm in a Bible study with a guy that also goes to our church, did the same thing. He went to a bookstore and bought the four spiritual laws. That's how he came to faith in Christ. So Wow. 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 So you did it there at your, when you were 31 years old, approximately. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. And now you're supposed to die before you're 40. Something happened. Well, I went through two years of chemotherapy, and each time it, the, the, um, my cancer came back in a more virulent form. In fact, I actually uh, was giving my son a bunch of my documents um, about a year ago, and he said, you know, the doctor's report says stage B, no, no further treatment recommended. And I said, yeah, I know. They told me there was, I could do interferon or platinum, but um, I, I was probably going to die within a year or so, and wow. that would have been five years. That would have been 35. Okay, well, so. what happened? Something obviously happened. So, you, I mean, you're still alive, yeah. last I checked. <laughs> well, I, I belong to a conservative denomination that was not exactly on the cutting edge of faith healing, but there was a church in the denomination that had some people that had actually taken James 5 seriously, and, and elders of that church said, if you come and pray, we'll be happy to pray over you anoint you with oil and so they did and um and i have never had any sign of cancer or any treatments since so that was 19 I don't know, 79 yeah maybe maybe later maybe in 1971 i'm 81 but um i became so excited about following jesus that i began reading the bible by the hours I began getting people to tutor me, and my management team came to me and said, Claire, you own 96% of the company. It's too big for us to buy, but your head is not here anymore. You're not getting any more patents. You just don't care about the business that much. And I said, yeah, you're right. So 1984, 35 years old, I sold the business, took no work contract, and um, I haven't had steady work since. That's been 40 years. <laughs> but you sold it to... To give full time to to the kingdom of God, basically, is that yeah? What you, yeah. That was your purpose. You yeah. felt the led of the Lord to do that, Claire. You know, um, I I just knew that God was calling me to something more, and I didn't know what that was. In fact, my wife Susan said, "Well, what are you actually going to do all day long?" And I said, "I don't know." Wow. And she said, "That's crazy talk because you always kind of have a plan." And I said. I understand. I think just God wants me to trust him enough to make me available to him and he'll figure out a plan. So I did a few things that didn't turn out all that well. I mean, volunteer ministry stuff. But people tell me, well, how do you figure out what God wants you to do? And I said, you know, Nike actually has it right. Pray a lot and just do it. Just just try something. And 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 over a period of time, I've discovered what what God how God had gifted me. Uh, both passion, spiritual gifts, natural giftedness, and and it took me a couple of years to kind of figure that out. But um, I praise God that I did because um, otherwise I just would have dove into good activities and do like most guys do my age or my, when they sell their business, they'll serve on a couple of boards and pontificate three times a year in warm places and play golf with the finder founder and then go out and buy more boats and stuff like that. Yeah. So. I was too young for that kind of thing. So <laughs> God kept me from some of those temptations. So Claire, you went from skeptical, a little fearful. Boy, if I give my life to Christ, it's, he's going to wreck my life to just total surrender, just giving all in, didn't you? Well, you know, total surrender is, a, is, I won't sing I surrender all anymore because I don't know anyone who is actually willing to surrender all. Wow. There's, each, there's a part of every one of us that wants to hold something back. Yeah. And I think Jesus or God kind of chokes on it when we sing that song. So I ask God when I sing that song, um, I surrender more. I want to surrender more. What oh, is I it love it. I love it. More? And that's so, really my prayer too, is Lord, 
what am I holding back? I don't want to hold anything back, but show me what is that I'm holding back out of fear or pride or anything. And, uh, and he'll show us as we pray. But you know, you mentioned Luke. One of my favorite scriptures is Luke 9, 23. If any man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. So let me ask you this. Yeah. You made that huge decision back when you're 31 years old, approximately. Mm -hmm. And again, it sounds like you, you've got no regrets making that decision. Yeah. Would that yeah, be fair not. to say? Yeah. But is it a one and done? So, hey, took care of that. Now I'm good to go for the rest of my life. Or is there a dailiness to your walk with Jesus? Well, I was raised with the Heidelberg Catechism. And the first question answer Ask comes, what are your chief aim in life? It's a different, they've changed that answer, that question a few different times. But the answer is this, that my life is not my own, that I belong body and soul uh, to my, in life and in death, my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so I realized when I came to faith that my life was no longer my own. It wasn't a one and done. Mm. It wasn't, well, I can do this time 65 and then kill time pleasantly in warm places. Yeah. Um, uh, that God has, I think, has will have a task for me until I breathe my last. I don't know what that task is, but um, I think the idea of retirement. Now, there are some people that need to retire. I have had the privilege of the last 40 years of having a, a pretty stress-free life. God has blessed me economically. I've been good health. And so I don't feel the need to retire. I, was, didn't, I didn't give 40 years to General Motors or to, you know, something yep. Else yep. that I had to wear myself up that I need to. So I don't want to be sac I don't want to be self-righteous about retirement. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a place for it to, to, to work less, to relax more, but to also do more ministry. Yeah. I just, I just have been given the opportunity that um, I, I want to keep doing what I'm doing until the day I die. There's I a funeral. Home, there's a funeral home in Grand Rapids named Zagman's. Yes, very famous. A lot of people, and so I, I tell people, I hope my last office is Zagman's. So <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Anyhow, oh no, that that's good. You know, some people refer rather than retirement, they say refirement is. You know, that can be really some of the most productive time in our life where we have a little bit extra time, but we've got the experience of our background. And we, if, if we allow the Lord to use us, we can touch mm -hmm. lives. Now, you've done that. In fact, I didn't even know this about you until we talked a few weeks ago, that you had a real heart for, I think it was deaf people yeah, mm -hmm. in a certain part of the world. Unpack that a little bit for us, would you? Yeah. I, actually, I didn't have much of a heart for deaf people. A guy came in my office who did have a, deaf, have a heart for deaf people looking for money, and he told me that, that the deaf there was no deaf Bible in any sign language of the world, including American sign language. And I said, well, okay, there might not be, you know, Hezekiah and Ezekiel and that, but I mean, there's certainly was a New Testament. No, there wasn't. I thought, well, that cannot be. I cannot believe that that for 2000 years, the deaf have been, why can't they just read the Bible? They told yeah. me. Yeah, that, why can't that, they just read the Bible? Yeah, 70, roughly uh, uh, 90, 6% of the world's deaf are functionally illiterate. Oh, okay. Particularly in second and third world countries, they don't read and write at all. Or wow. they read and write so minimally that, and and so I didn't know that. So um, he spent three hours in my office and I finally said to him, listen, give me the phone numbers of the two or three largest deaf churches in the United States. So he left my office and I called some of them. Mm -hmm. and it took a day or so to get through all of them. And I told him what this guy had told me. Mm -hmm. And they said, yeah, we don't have a deaf Bible. We don't have a sign language Bible. And I said, you mean nobody has done anything? No. So I knew he was living in an abandoned orphanage with four families in Union Mills, North Carolina, way back in Appalachia. Wow. So I said, you know what? I called him up and I said, I'm going to come down for a couple of days and try to understand deaf culture. And so I flew in and drove up to this little town in the middle of nowhere meeting these people that i'd never met before and spent four days just trying to understand deaf culture deaf people what they knew what they didn't know and i came back to grand rapids and i said to my wife i think i found my next ministry 
She wow. said, you don't, know anything, you, don't, you don't know anything about the death. And I said, you're right, I don't, but apparently nobody else does either. I think I got a shot at it. You know? So this other guy, um, his name is Mike Booth, who is my hero, who really did this full time. Mm -hmm. um, he and the team, I, I became the first chairman, founding chairman of Door International. And, um, and he and the team worked for the next two to three years, actually figuring out how to communicate um, uh, the Bible to deaf people in more than just signs and just words. Mm. And, um, and so, uh, praise God, today is 25 years later. We have 232 full-time people all over the world. We have a campus in Kenya and a campus in Bangalore, India, and teams in Russia, China, Thailand, Philippines, uh, Europe, uh, uh, Central America, South America. And God has been incredibly good and 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 people have thanked me a thousand times but i go you know um i just the god brought me to really gifted godly people who are way smarter than i did i was just fairly good at putting together boards and doing some fundraising and kind of helping out whenever i could but um it, um taking credit for their success is like the rooster taking credit for the sunrise so <laughs> <laughs> oh but obviously as a result of that Deaf people have access to the Bible that they did not have before. Yes, they do. And yeah. is it is so, it in sign language or how do oh, they? Yeah. Okay, just Let's... just Google Deaf Bibles um, or Door International, and you'll go to our website. And actually, if you go there, you have to navigate the website by sign language. So you click on the flag of your country, because most deaf people know the flag of their country. Oh, sure. Then it will take them to someone who is signing to them saying. Hi, welcome to to Door International, and wow. um, I'm going to introduce you to the Bible. And the Bible was, and it gives them background, and then they go right into the first story oh. of the Bible. So, um, so that probably has touched millions of, of lives. Oh, I think so. A uh, Wycliffe was was very generous with us. They came to the conclusion we have no idea how to translate that oh. Bible, so they raised over a million dollars a year for us to 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 um translate them. but they they did train us because they said if you're going to do this we want to make sure what you're giving people is actual scripture and not just you know nice little pithy little oh, yeah, stories sure. about yeah. bible yeah. stories like a yeah. children's bible story book so they're pretty serious about quality control so they've been in, incredible partners with us the seed company wickliffe international book of associates yeah so oh that's amazing yeah. so you also have written a book Mm -hmm. and uh, it's called The 10 Second Rule. When, mm -hmm. when did you write that, uh, Claire? How long ago? Yeah, about 12 years ago. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that's a lot of people have bought it and uh, like it. What What's what's the basic premise in that book? So about 20 years ago, a pastor from China taught me the 10 second rule, so I didn't come up with the idea. Okay. Uh, and, uh, and he said, here's the 10 second rule. Just do the next thing you're reasonably certain Jesus wants you to do and do it quickly before you change your mind. Now, at first glance, I thought, I kind of rolled my eyes and go, this is one of these pithy little things that you see in Christian uh -huh. bookstores on mugs and t-shirts, sure. junk like that to sell. But then I began thinking about it. And I, I went, you know, because I used to ask people all the time, what does it mean to follow Jesus? And, um, or they would ask me that question. And I would kind of give them a long explanation well what does it mean to follow jesus if it doesn't mean you're willing to do the next thing jesus you're reasonably certain jesus wants you to do yeah um and so i thought well that was good so i started teaching to people and i had a one paragraph summary of the tense of a rule and a guy that went to my church said to me well Claire, that's not really helpful to me i got a bunch of questions when i teach it to people they have questions mm -hmm. can you give me something more can you give me half a dozen pages with some background and Bible verses and, you know, what about this? What about that? And when should you use this? When should you not? So um, one Sunday morning, I started writing a more brief summary. Mm -hmm. And about three hours later, I came up and woke my wife and I said, I think God wants me to write a book. <laughs> and she said, you've always said the world does not need one more Christian book. I said, I realized, but think of the irony if I saw Jesus someday. And he held me responsible for not writing a book on obedience. So, so, <laughs> so, so ten seconds. Ten seconds later, you started writing the book. Uh, actually, 
I finished it in about three weeks, but it wasn't, wow. it was, it was only about 15,000 pages. Wow. I, I mean, words, Yeah. but it was all that I, you know, I had exhausted sure. all that I knew about well, it. Oh, that's good. And um, so the rest is history, so to speak. And yeah, well, that's the good. Lord, Lord allowed me to find a publisher and, yeah. and wow, that's, so that's I've good. been, the Lord has been good. Well, that is good. So again, backing up to just how God got your attention at the beginning. I mean, you said, I wanted to make money, build this business. You know, there's a number of people that are watching and listening to this uh, uh, podcast. And they're, they're, they're there. They say, you know, if only I could graduate, get married, have a child, get some money, get this business, then I'll be happy. If only, if only, if only sort of thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, what would you want to say to those folks? Oh, sure. I speak to those kind of people all the time. I'll say, I know what, you, what some of you smart young guys are actually thinking. I'm going to do the Clarity Guy Plan. I'm going to work my tail off, make a ton of money, retire early, and then I'll devote my life to God. And I said, let me tell you, that's rare that I've met people that actually do that. Mm. That's like saying, I'm going to binge drink all through college, then I'm going to stop. Yeah. Once you get hooked on materialism, it is really difficult to stop. Mm. And I said, for me, we actually, my wife and I agreed to put the majority of the sales of the proceeds of the company into a foundation because I knew that I was a recovering materialist. And to have my hands on that much money all my life, I had, had dreamt of private jet, having a private jet. I actually had private jet money at one at one time and it scared the wits out of me mm -hmm. and so i realized i needed to put some boundaries in my life and paint myself into a corner because i didn't trust myself wow and so i said i'm not telling you this because i'm so disciplined because i'm so spiritual i did it because i was i knew that i was not disciplined enough to say no if i didn't put some natural barriers in my life to keep me mm -hmm. from doing that kind of thing mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so that's my, um, yeah, I'm sure there's a lot of people think that's a great plan. And, but I've only known maybe a dozen people of all the people. And I, I, I speak across the country. I probably only know a dozen people who retired early that actually successfully made the transition into the majority ministry, whatever it is. Yeah. Okay. And, um, and so, you know, wealth is, has its dangers. That's yeah. why Jesus warned against it. Yep. It isn't money that's the problem. It's the love of money, and it's our dependence on money. Yeah. And uh, so I'm I'm still a recovering materialist. Yeah, I yeah. And it, it it doesn't satisfy the deep needs in our heart. Uh, it, you know, Saint Augustine said, "Our hearts are restless till they find the rest in Him." Mm -hmm. They do. And uh, it, obviously, you're 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 a joyful guy. How you, how yeah, I love you that. are you you ever you come across as upbeat joyful and if you know you could have all the money in the world but it, it, it's it's not it's never enough it's always you know they ask a multi-millionaire how much is enough it's always another million another million it's never enough yeah but Jesus, I was fortunate I was, I was fortunate that I was raised by um a mother who was optimistic uh -huh. and she taught us to be optimistic I mean I just assume yeah. that most people are good i just assume that um life is going to be good going forward mm -hmm. and if it isn't then you kind of figure it out after that so uh -huh. um I, I don't say this because i'm so virtuous i was just kind of raised as um by somebody who um who gave more than she took in yeah and, uh, and so um i i was very fortunate but also you have that personal relationship with the lord jesus christ yeah and you know he loves you and he is he was just he's the reason why you're doing what you've been doing for the last 40 years he is the reason uh, oh. for certain you know you any, any regrets at all any regrets about that uh, well my only regret is that it took 31 years for me to figure out that that my life was not my own uh, i love it <laughs> i love it claire uh well, let me just show for people if they want to get more information um here is uh, just, you know, your book, uh, the uh, the 10 second rule, and then website, you can go to it, www.claire, C-L-A-R-E, D-G-R-A-F.com. 
and uh, they can get more information. Anything more you want to share before we close? No, no, I don't sell books on my website. So you can go to Amazon or Christian bookstores. They, yep. They'll get them. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. Anyway, but thank you, Randy, because you've been an inspiration to me for many, many years because uh, you, you were an attorney. You could have just stayed in a good big practice and made a ton of money. But our first time we met was when we adopted um, our first child and you did the adoption as oh, a judge. Those were my so, fun. Those were my fun times. I love those. So, yeah. Actually, I was 42 years old now. So that's wow. why I know I know when we first met. So, uh, praise God. Well, why don't you close us in prayer, would you, Claire? I would. Oh, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the joy of our salvation. Thank you for loving us more than than we will ever be able to love you. Thank you for not only showing us the way, but being the way, the yes. truth and the life. And so, Lord, I just pray that as people listen to this podcast, that they that they don't turn it off and go, well, I want to be like Claire. I want them desperately to be like you, That's to love so you, to yes. serve you, and to be whatever you want them to be. And if they do, if we do, we're going to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Lord, for loving us so desperately for, um, for, in my case, the hound of heaven riding me down and finding me even when I didn't want to be found. Mm -hmm. We bless you, God, and bless Randy and his ministry and his podcast. And just pray that it will exponentially reach more and more people um, with the gospel and the love of Jesus. Mm -hmm. We bless you, God. Amen. 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 I well, love you, brother. Thank you so much, Claire. I hey, love you too, Randy. Bye-bye.